Uh, let me do something I've done everywhere I've, when I have the opportunity to, to put together a conference. I remind those who are there that uh, we primarily came to meet the Lord. You cannot determine when he's going to encounter you. But when he does, if it's right in the middle of my speaking, do not tell the Lord. When Henry's finished speaking, I'll talk to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? If right in the middle of the sharing, God encounters you, there's an altar or there's a prayer room, you need to go immediately and deal with God. And sometimes I think God deliberately meets us in the middle of someone else's speaking to see what we do next. Because what we do next indicates what we believe about him regardless of what we say. And so if at any time during these moments, somehow in the wisdom and the mercy and the grace of God, he spoke to you and he pinpointed something in your life or ministry. And in effect, he is saying, you better deal with this or your ministry is over. Do not hesitate. Run. Run and meet him and let him deal with you until he's through with you. Uh, it's his invitation to make the changes. Uh, you may be standing on the edge of a spiritual cliff and don't know. You're unaware of it, but God is aware of it. And you're about to lose it all. And there are times when you lose it all and absolutely cannot recover it. And things are never the same again. All the way through the Bible, that is true. When Moses sinned against God by telling God that he knows better than God, and by the way, that moment when he struck the rock is an interesting one for us as pastors. God never or rarely ever does the same thing twice. There was only one burning bush, was there not? But if that had happened in our day, we would have had somebody write a book on how to identify burning bushes <laughs> and been going all over the place. And uh, that's an instructive one. What did God say to Moses to do the first time he brought water? Strike it. Did he not? But the second time, God said, speak to it. And he struck it. And what did it cost him? He could not enter the promised land. And Moses pled with God several times. And suddenly God says, Moses, don't ever bring that subject up again. You are not going into the promised land. End discussion. But folks, we have a tendency to believe that we can treat God any way we want and we can <coughs> sin any way we want and as long as we, quotes, repent and God forgives, he can restore us to the original ministry. I'm just one that says that's not at all possible. And uh, I was talking with a wonderful guy up in Wisconsin, tall fellow. He was, was Lutheran, and then uh, God directed his life, and he was now co-pastor. But he said, uh, he said, I'm greatly disturbed in my spirit. For he said, I, I was divorced. But the church where I'm now in feels obviously I have the call of God and I'm serving. Then he said, with tears, he said, I want you to be absolutely honest with me. I want you to share with me exactly how you feel about that. Don't spare me at all. I said, that's the way I would have answered anyway. <laughs> but I said, 
There's a little word in both of the qualifications for a pastor, both in Timothy and Titus, that eliminates you from being an active pastor, and that's the word blameless. I said that word is not saying sinless, it says blameless. And you don't qualify. And his new wife was sitting with him. And they both wept. And when we talked further, we must have talked for an hour. He said, could you, just, could you tell me about that? And I said, I can. And I can tell you why that's there. And I can tell you why what you do in that area of your life can be fatal to your ministry. And of course, someone always says, well, God used David. And I said, David was not a priest. He was a king. But a priest, very strict guidelines for the priest. But anyway, I think it's critically important that when God speaks to us, we go alone with God and let him finish what he began. Because you cannot determine what God is trying to say to you. And there may be, you may be right on the edge of a precipice for your ministry. And God says, one more step and you've lost it all. But the mindset of our generation does not believe that. And we use human reasoning to describe a God who is not the God revealed in the Bible at all, but the God that we have made and that we want, but not the God who revealed himself to us. So, we're going to, so if at any time there comes a moment where you sense clearly that God is speaking to you, You'll not disturb me or anybody else if you either go out to a separate room or just come and kneel and pray and let the Lord deal with you. And if he overwhelms you, just let, it, let him do it. Because did we not come to meet the Lord? Amen. And I don't know about you, but I anticipated that I would meet the Lord in fresh and new ways that I had not seen before. Brother Mark, uh, and I have to jump off on this one a bit. This is a very informal time, by the way, and if there's a pattern, I'm going to do some sharing. Uh, we will have a break partway through, halfway through, and there will be a time for questions and answers, and there will be a time for prayer where you can do whatever you like. Pray with someone, pray in small groups, get on your knees where you are, but I think it is an affront to a holy God to ever plan to meet him and then not have the opportunity to respond to him. And I believe when the God of the universe speaks, that's the time we need to uh, respond. So uh, we'll do that. But Brother Mark mentioned that a lady came to him and said there's a, there's a passage of scripture that I think she said uh, is for all of us here. And uh, she turned him to Jeremiah 23 and the first three verses. I'm very familiar with Jeremiah. And very familiar with Jeremiah 23. And one of the basic reasons is how we have unfaithfully handled the Word of God. Um, and one of them is how we have understood what Jesus said when he said in the middle of his ministry, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. And we immediately use that as the basis for evangelism with the unbeliever. It's not what it means at all. When the Lord Jesus makes a statement as significant as that one, he took it from, my, from Jeremiah 23, where he said, God says to Jeremiah, my shepherds have abandoned my people. They have let them go out onto the mountains. They have not pursued them. They have not healed them. They have not fed them. 
They have not gone to seek and to save that which is lost, but I'm going to raise up a shepherd after my own heart, and he will seek out and save that which is lost. Says it about three times. He was not talking about the unbeliever. He was talking about the people of God. And God was trying to say the deepest heart cry of God is for his people. Because as goes the people of God, so goes the rest of the world. And if you do not pay attention to the people of God, evangelism comes to a screeching halt. Evangelism is a byproduct of the quality of the people of God that he has entrusted to you. The degree to which they walk with him is the degree to which they have an incredible witness that they cannot keep quiet about. And you'll find that the closer the people of God come to a relationship to God, the more profound is their witness. And that's why revival always precedes spiritual awakening. Because uh, revival is something that can only happen to the people of God. The lost person has never been vived, so they can't be revived. And so the only ones who can be revived are those who once knew him. So God's first order is to deal with his own. Because as goes his own, so goes all his purpose to work through his own to touch a lost world. And I have found that the more I spend, more time I spend helping God's people to come toward Christ's likeness, uh, the more there was an immediate spontaneous witness. I remember talking to some deacons and they said, Pastor, if you just, this was in the second church I pastored in Los Angeles. And they said, Pastor, if you just uh, give us some assignments. And I said, I won't do that. He said, what do you mean? I said, if I have to come to the place where I assign you to love someone, you're in trouble. But, but pastor, couldn't you, these visitors and people, couldn't you just assign some to us? And I said, no, I won't do that. I'd be hurting you as your pastor. My desire is to lead you into a relationship to Christ in such a way that you are begging. You are going to the place where the, where the prospects are found, where you just go and you, and you let the Lord guide you and you go to the members of the church and those under your watch care. And I said, I'll never have to assign you if you have a love relationship to the Lord. But I can do you great harm by assigning you someone to love. And they caught it. And they let me lead them into a growing love relationship to the Lord. I never had to assign one deacon to go out and love a lost person or to go out and love a believer. They did it spontaneously. I've always said what you do spontaneously is the best indicator of the condition of your heart. If you have to think about it, your heart has shifted. And what you do when you face people, what you do spontaneously without thinking is where your heart is. And uh, I, when I'm, I've, you know, I pastored more than 30 years and so I've, I have a, a great heart cry uh, for pastors, and I've written a number of things which uh, all deal with the pastor, and, and of course, the spiritual leadership book has a whole chapter on pitfalls of the spiritual leader. But uh, the book we, we wrote on Fresh Encounter has a whole section just on spiritual leadership. As a matter of fact, that section is spiritual leadership in times of revival and awakening. Let me read you a couple of the chapter titles. The role of the spiritual leader. The qualities of a spiritual leader. Personal revival for spiritual leaders. Preparing the way of the Lord. That's what you do. You don't prepare the way for the Lord. You prepare the way of the Lord. He's already got a way. And you're supposed to lead them in the way of the Lord. Chapter 17, guiding God's people to return to Him. Now, if you pastor at any length of time, that one's going to be a toughie for you. How do I guide the people from where they are to where they ought to be? How do I lead them into corporate repentance? How do I guide the people of God to return to God? Chapter 18, when revival comes, the spiritual leader 
should never be caught off guard. That long before God brings a mighty movement of His Spirit, you are fully prepared. You know exactly what to do. You know what God is going to do and you have already prepared your heart and you've prepared your church for an encounter with God. And we, we deal with that in a whole chapter. And then the last two are times for continuing revival and uh, praying for revival in the land. There is a bit of a difference between praying for revival in the land and praying for revival in your church or your community. So we have tried to, uh, to help pastors. And this comes out of the crucible of my own personal walk with the Lord and deeply desiring to be the kind of shepherd and servant that God is looking for. Well, I, I want to, uh, I, I had a, a moment with the Lord as I walked here uh, a bit ago. And it goes something like this. I was looking at the flowers. I mean, is an is a artificial flower the same as the one God creates? Is there any substitute for the real thing? No matter how you make it look like it, there's no life in it. And then I looked at the rest of the nature, and then I thought about not only the flowers, I thought about every other part of his creation. And does not the Bible say, the heavens declare the glory of God? Firmament speaks. And every part of his creation is speaking to us, is it not? And it is, is not the creator greater than the things he creates? And so you can wonder at the flowers, but is there any beauty that equals the one who created them? But we can wonder at the creation and never move toward the beauty of the creator. And uh, I began to think of the uniqueness of his creation and how the flowers are different and how everything about his creation is unique and very special. But I found everything in my being saying, I, I must go beyond his handiwork to the one who created it. And you could put everything that God created and stand in utter wonder and it won't even come close to the wonder of the person himself. <coughs> and I believe that God created all of this as a constant reminder to draw us to himself. And of all the people who ought to stand in awe and wonder, it is the pastor, the one called of God. Because when God calls you, he also equips you. So there's some things God does in you that he does not do in the ordinary person. And I hope to God that you do not lose the wonder of the call to ministry and make it just the, let's ordain the janitor because he's called. Don't you let anybody do that. The call to be a shepherd of the people of God is unique. And God gives you the equipping to function thoroughly in that role. There are some things God brings to your life when he calls you that he does not bring to anybody else. And the assignment he's given you, he matches the equipping. I've always said the gifting of God always follows the assignment, never precedes it. And all through the Old Testament, when God gave an assignment, then the Spirit came upon them to equip them to do it. And when God withdrew the assignment from Saul, he also withdrew the equipping. He no longer needed it because he did not have the assignment. And in the New Testament, that is exactly the same. Where God puts you in the body, not the universal body, the local body, then the Spirit of God equips you to function in the body where he puts you. If God makes you an eye, what does he need to equip you to do? See. See. But according to 1 Corinthians 12, 7, 
The gift is the Spirit himself, and he manifests himself to every member for the common good. Not for you. The gift of seeing is not primarily for you. It's so the hand knows where to reach and the foot knows where to walk so the body can function. And so where he puts you in the body is how he's going to equip you. And I keep saying to pastors, you need to find out very, very carefully where God put you in the body. I can tell you where he didn't put you. You're not the head. That position's already occupied. <laughs> I'm serious because too many pastors are functioning as though they're the head and the whole body has to respond to them. Foolishness. The head is Christ. And when I understood that, I let God put me in the body where he wanted to. And then I watched how he equipped me to function in the body, but that was not for me. It was so that every part of the body could come to Christ's likeness so that Christ had a mature body so that we all grew up into the head and we were all made to come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And when the body is connected to the head and healthy and mature, then Christ has, an, has a vehicle through which he can work to do the Father's will. It is still true that the Father assigns to his Son in a new body. Now let me ask you about your church. Did Christ ever misunderstand the will of the Father? Did he ever fail to do the will of the Father? As head of your congregation, will the living Christ ever fail to understand what the Father wants to do with that body? Will he ever fail to seek to marshal the entire body to do the will of God? I mean, you got it made. If you just understand how to relate to the head. And when God gives an assignment, he, in the giving of the assignment, he guarantees the completion of it. And what an excitement that one is. Well, we want to, we want to talk in a couple of directions with you. Um, and uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to confront us together with some very, very important scriptures. Well, first of all, I want to ask you this question because what I'm going to do in talking about the pitfalls to leadership or spiritual leadership, you need to have at least a little bit of an understanding of what spiritual leadership is and why and how it comes about. And then there's a root cause. Dr. Roberts, he's not a doctor, and he gives me a bad time every time I call him that. But I, I've been around him enough to know I hereby anoint him as doctor. <laughs> Doesn't mean a thing, Brother Roberts, but uh, I treat you with great, great honor. And it won't be from men, it will be from God. Well, that anointing is already on him. So we can't add anything by anything we do. But um, I, want to, I, want to, uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions. The things I'm going to ask you and then talk about the, the consequences of this. Brother Roberts has said, and it's deeply affected me more than he knows, he has said there's, there's some root systems from which everything else comes. Now, when I go to my doctor and he sees the symptoms, he doesn't treat the symptoms. He takes the symptoms to try and identify the root cause for those symptoms. So when the root cause is dealt with, all the symptoms disappear. Is that not true? Now, as a pastor, for heaven's sakes, don't keep treating the symptoms. You can wear yourself out doing that. You need to treat the root cause. 
when you deal with that one, all the symptoms disappear. Now, I want to go back to a basic. I do this for my own life, and I do it regularly. When God made a statement, let me tell you, he said, what I really want. What is the basic fundamental desire of the heart of God from you? What's, what's basic from which everything else comes? He love said, I want you to love the Lord your God. How much? With all of your heart. We'll talk about that in a moment. Because I can tell you, when your heart shifts, everything else shifts. But you don't deal with the symptom, you deal with the root cause. And the greatest single pitfall to a pastor is the loss or the turning aside from the love relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the heart of it. For instance, if you are in that intimate personal relationship with Christ, there's no possibility that you can commit adultery. You know why? It would be so abhorrent to you. you. You could not do that to your Lord. You could not do that to His name. You couldn't possibly do that. I couldn't do it just because of the relationship with my wife or the incredible hurt it would cause to my five children if I did that. But folks, you can put all that together and my love relationship with the Lord Jesus goes all over that one. I can't do it. I can't do it. And he said, you're to love the Lord your God with all of your mind. The number one pitfall of pastors and missionaries and spiritual leaders is pornography. Number one. Let me tell you the deterrent to that. Love the Lord your God with all of your mind. You better guard your mind. But how do you do it? You bring it and make it subject to Christ. Is that not what Paul said when he says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God? Then he says you take every thought and bring it into captivity to Christ. Now, if you do not guard your mind, you're in a spiritual uh, minefield that can destroy you in one shot. I, someone was talking to me about our, my quiet time with the Lord, and, and I said, well, my quiet time with the Lord, I don't call it that, but my time before the Lord begins the night before. I've determined, Brother Roberts, you're in the front row. You don't mind me using you from time to time. I determined I would not watch CNN news as the last thing that I had in my mind before I went to sleep. What you go to sleep with is going to take you all the way through the night and you'll still be thinking about it in the morning. The mayhem that sin is causing in our world can cause you sleepless nights. Well, why in the world do you let that be the last thing that you watch before you go to bed? My time alone with God in the morning begins the night before. And I'm exceedingly careful that I love the Lord my God with all my mind. And I guard my mind. And I just do not let anything come through my mind. And I go, and every time you start to think about the scriptures, they all come rushing at you. And he says, Why don't you just set your mind on the things above, where you and Christ are seated together with the Father? Why don't you let your mind be there? Or Psalm 1. Let me tell you the one, could I make it personal and say, and this is what I have done in my own ministry. He said, let me tell you the one, the pastor, anywhere under any condition, 
Do you know how you can be a pastor anywhere and be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bring forth your fruit in its season, your leaf never withers, and whatever you do, prosper. You know how to do that? Psalm 1. This one meditates on the law day and night. But many of us want to meditate on everything else, all of our activities, all of our programs, all of our goals, all the things that we want to do for God. And he said, none of that will ever make you productive. You're going to have to meditate on the law. You're going to have to meditate on his word day and night. Without exception, whatever you do will prosper. Now, how would you know if you were not doing it? You're not prospering. God would have to cease to be God not to do what he said. But you know what we do? That pitfall is very real. But we make every excuse under the sun why we can't do that day and night. Let me ask you another question. Does Christ dwell within you? Does he dwell within you only during your quiet time? How much of the day is the living Lord of the universe resident in your life? 24 hours a day. Then how much of that day can he speak to you? Well, whenever you let him. No, sir, he can speak to you anytime he wants. Our problem is we don't expect him to speak to us. And a tremendous pitfall in a, a pastor's life is not to live out that 24-hour-a-day relationship with the living Lord. And when I go to those passages like Isaiah 5, uh, 65 and 6 and, and into Jeremiah 7, I think it is, and God says something like this, I called unto you again and again, but there was no reply. I spoke to you again and again. There was no response. I rose up early speaking to you, but there was no response. Pastor, do you not then come trembling before a holy God and say, last week, how many times did you try to speak to me, but you never could get an answer from me? You never expected me to speak to you in that phone call you got. And when you did get a phone call, you never meditated on that. You never asked me what in the world this means. I go back to something I may have shared earlier. To give you an idea, just a couple of days ago, I had to practice what I'm telling you. Right in the middle of the day, got a phone call from the office of chief of army chaplains. And Larry said, Henry, I've read the, uh, the, the spiritual leadership book and I've taken the initiative to establish a whole pattern for developing and training the, the, the army chaplains to become spiritual leaders that are very healthy in their walk with God. And when I read your book, I said, uh, I wonder if he would be willing to help me design that. Now, how would you handle that? As a message from Washington or from heaven? <laughs> Folks, I want you to know everything within me said, Father, who is sufficient for such a thing as this? Then I began to meditate. What do you do when God speaks to you? Do you meditate and say, Father, you just introduced me to something. What do you have in mind? And the longer I meditated on that, on that particular day, you know what came to mind? And the Holy Spirit's the only one who can do it. You cannot do it by human reasoning. Now, I'm a very ordinary person. Any of you know where Williams Lake, British Columbia is? Oh, there's a couple. Well, can anything good come out of Williams Lake, British Columbia? <laughs> 
And I see myself as so very, very ordinary. And then when that came, I then closed down everything. I mean, when the God of the universe does something, do you shut down everything? Or do you continue with your agenda? God deliver us from that. Amen. That's one of the great pitfalls of the ministry. We don't know how to relate to the one who told us to love him with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. When I meditated on it, I was, I was trembling when I finished. Because whenever there's something about to take place here, God starts way back here. And my, my response was, is America going to face something in the near future that's going to require the military chaplains to be on a level of spiritual leadership they've never had to be before? God doesn't play games. When God initiates something, it is God-sized and has eternal consequences to it. And my mind, I just trembled and I cried. I said, Lord, what are you trying to say? And are you wanting me to be a partner to shape the direction of the spiritual intensity of the army chaplains, which could in turn touch all the other branches of the military, and knowing very well that our chaplains on the national level interrelate with Canada's chaplains and others around the world? And my mind just blew. I said, what did you just say to me? But can you imagine God when I stand before him saying, Henry, let me tell you what could have been when you got that phone call. Let me tell you what could have been if you'd only listened and if you'd only asked me why. What did God say to you last week? You didn't even know it was God. But it was. And in this matter of spiritual awakening, I have had something that's really disturbed me a bit. Because in many ways, what we're doing is saying, Oh Lord, would you come in a great earthquake, spiritual earthquake? He said, I don't come in the earthquake. Well, at least could you bring a great sweeping fire? And he said, I don't come in the fire. Well, could you bring a great wind of the Spirit? He said, I don't come in that. Well, Lord, how in the world do you come? He said, I come in a still, small voice. But you don't think that's revival. When I speak with a still, small voice, all there is of me is speaking. And all there is of me is present. Have you been crying out to God for a great earthquake, spiritually, a great fire, a wind? And God said... You really don't think I'm present, do you, when all you get is a still, small voice? And you know what God was about to do in that still, small voice? He was about to assign Elijah to go and anoint two kings and to anoint Elisha to take his place. Do you know that all of eternity hung in the balance in a still, small voice? When was the last time you expected God to come in a still, small voice. Or are you still in revival praying for the great cataclysmic moment when God said, you know, there was a sinner woman. She was a prostitute. And I brought her to your office and you turned it over to someone else. But little did you realize when that woman came to know the Lord, all of Sychar would come to know the Lord. And it would be so profound that the city right next to it called Samaria would come to know the Lord. And the Spirit would send Philip down to find out what in the world God was up to. And revival came across the whole of Samaria and it started at a well with a woman of the street. Now, did Jesus know when the Father was speaking to him? And did he know the profound implications of God bringing one woman into a relationship with himself? Did he know that all of Samaria would hear the gospel as a result? So, as a pastor, I would say, Father, don't only let me know what I missed 
But I believe one day you're going to say, Henry, all the accumulated possibilities of what you missed are also laid against your account. Not just what you missed, but what all I intended to do if you'd only listened. And one of the best pictures I know is that one woman and the rest of the apostles were saying, you're wasting your time. One of the great pitfalls in the ministry is you don't recognize the still small voice of God. You're going to have to cultivate a listening ear to God. Now I want to give you one other and then I'm going to do a little more specifics in the, in the pitfalls. I want you to feel the implication of this because I had to do it as a pastor and it made a radical difference in everything I did and to this day it does. I mean, every day I'm facing this one. And... Uh, Many of you are very much aware of John 13. Is that not the great servant picture? And those of you who know Max Greiner, who does statues of Jesus washing Peter's feet. Max and I are good friends. He's a mess, but he's a great artist. <laughs> but you know, one of the most significant parts to that is that everything that follows in that 13th chapter is based on what he did when he served. And let me give you a verse that you've heard me talk on many times, but I want to bring it back to you because it's one of the great pitfalls of ministry when we lose the relationship with the living Lord. See, when your greatest root problem is the relationship of love to him, but all the rest of the Bible tells you what that means. So in the 20th verse, he makes this statement. How you receive the one I send you, you receive me. And how you receive me, you have received my Father who sent me. Now again, if... Brother Roberts, I can ask forgiveness rather than permission. He will never know. He'll never know how much of Christ I came to know because God sent him to my life. I don't know if you've got to know this, dear brother. But I can tell you one thing. He has come to know Christ in a way that none of us have. God doesn't duplicate anything. When God comes to an individual, it is a unique, all of our background, all of our idiosyncrasies, all of our sensitivities. We come to know Christ uniquely, unlike anyone else on the face of the earth. We have come to know our Lord. And there's going to be a whole dimension of the person of Jesus Christ that I will never know if I don't know it through my brother. I can't know it the way they have. And they look at it, it's like a diamond. You can look at it from a thousand angles and you'll see something more beautiful. And I can tell you, the person of our Lord has so much about him that it takes all of us experiencing him and then bringing our life alongside of our brothers and simply sharing that. And you come to know something about him you never could have known if you'd not heard that from them. And so Jesus says, how you receive the one I send you, you've received me. <coughs> and how you've received me, you've received the one who sent me. So, Brother Mark, there's no question in my mind, you're unique. Not because of you, but because of the Christ who chose to let you know some things about him. He didn't let me know that. But I will never know him that way unless I know him through you. And not only do you need to share out of the uniqueness of your perception and experience with the Lord. 
But you need to share it in a way that I can understand it. And I want you to know, I'll know more about Jesus after I've talked to you than I could have possibly known without you. But he then makes that a unique statement to say, and how you receive me, you've come face to face with my Father. How then should I treat you? Very carefully. As a sacred trust from God. Let me ask you, how are you receiving those God sends to you? It was just a 16-year-old boy. No, it wasn't. It was the living Lord who came face to face with you. He happened to have a 16-year-old body. But if you had taken time to try and disciple him, you would have come to know something about the Lord you have never known before. You would have had a tenderness and a gentleness. I met a 16-year-old here. And uh, Dave, where are you? Where is Dave? Yeah, your son. What's his first name? David. You need to know, David, when I had just a few minutes with you, I had an experience with the Lord. That was very, very special to me. You didn't know anything about that, did you? But John 13, 20 was happening through you in just how long does it take Christ to make himself known? One sentence. And you know just to know that you're standing on the edge of your life saying Lord what would you have me to be was so refreshing to me personally because I'm getting along not as far as some others but You have no idea what it does to me to know that my Lord is still in the business of calling teenagers. It did something inside me. Can you learn something about the Lord and the Father? How are you receiving the ones He sent you? It may be a fellow pastor. What is He trying to tell you about Himself? Now, are we not in grave danger? Is that not one of the great pitfalls of the ministry? When we cry out for the Lord to make Himself real, and He said, you don't understand the way in which I chose to do it. I sent four people to you last week, and you didn't receive any of them as you would receive me. Now, I don't make you an independent communicator with me. I have made you interdependent by creation. You see, sin creates independence and redemption creates interdependence. We need each other and God created us so that you can never know more of Him unless you receive it from your brother or your sister. That's why when I was thinking of marrying Marilyn 42 years ago, I said, uh, Marilyn, you need to tell me every vow you've ever made to God because God takes vows very seriously. And God caused you to want to make some vows to Him. And the vows you made to Him was His way of preparing you for our marriage. And I need to know every vow you've ever made to God because I know the heart of God on that. And I will spend the rest of my life helping you fulfill every vow you've ever made to God. Our marriage and our home rests on it. Now, what did I do? I was very careful how I received the one the Father sent me. You know that for 21 years, God had been working on my wife and preparing her. Would it not have been a tragedy if for 21 years God prepared her to be my wife and I did not understand that it was him that I received when I received my wife. 
So I treat her very, very carefully. And one of the, now, can you think for a moment? You're looking at the root, you're looking at the root of your life. It is a love relationship to God, but it, it brings itself out in scriptures like this. But can you think that if I simply loved my Lord with all of my heart and all the ways in which he has chosen to express himself to me, that that would secure my marriage? Would that not create one of the greatest deterrents to the pitfall of a broken marriage? It would. You see, you look at the symptom and say, well, my wife's my problem or my husband. No, 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 no. Your love relationship to Jesus is the problem. You forgot that he gave her to you and he prepared her and you have neglected your relationship to him by neglecting your relationship to, the, to your wife. Did God not give you your children? How did you receive them? Did you hold that little one as a sacred trust and say, how I receive this boy. I receive my Lord. And how I receive my Lord, I've received my heavenly Father. How then would I treat my children? How much time would I give them? What would I watch to see God doing in their life? You see, family problems are the product of choices we've made with God. It has nothing to do with environment. It has nothing to do with the world in which we live or TV. You can blame everything and anything you want and God will simply say, you didn't understand, did you? I told you to love those I gave you as you would be loving me and my father, but you never did. And now, did I not tell you whatever you sow, you reap? And the root produces the fruit. And you can't have all of this rotten fruit if you had a good root system. You just need to accept it and ask me to change the root system. You're going to have to ask me to bring you to the deepest personal relationship that's possible with me and you'll watch the fruit be the product of that. Now is that not what Jesus said in John 15? Is he not the vine and you're the branch if you abide in him and his words abide in you? You will bring forth fruit. Now, let me tell you what so often people do. They look and see no fruit in their life or their ministry and then they try to blame it on everybody else. And Jesus said, why don't you just go back to the simplicity of what I said? If your relationship is right with me, you will bear fruit. Now, why don't you just deal with that one? Well, Lord, you don't understand. He said, I don't understand. It's you who don't understand. There was a pitfall in your ministry. You forgot the relationship with me. And you tried to have substitutes for instance, does God want your heart or does he want your gifts? He wants your heart. And how would you know and how would he know if he had your heart? How would God know if he had your heart? And how would he know that you love him? Well, what happens next? How much time do you spend with him? How do you, and if you love God with all of your heart, you'll love your children the same way because you will receive them as you would Him. And you'd spend time with them. And you'd talk with them. And you'd find out what the Father is doing in their mind and in their heart. And you'd say, Father, if, if how I treat my son, and I I've not only have four sons and a daughter and then 13 grandchildren, but uh, I got a whole lot of the Lord that I'm learning <laughs> from each of them. But I can tell you, my concern is that I treat them as one that He has sent me. And I treat them as I would treat my Lord and treat the Father. 
Now, have they responded? They have. And they've responded to him. The way I have treated my Lord, and by the way, this matter of time, right now I'm having the privilege of uh, being a keynote speaker where one of my sons is also a keynote speaker. So we speak together. Now, one of my sons, facetious, well, they all joined in in, in a quartet. But they said, Dad, you know why we really entered the ministry? You used the four of us as an illustration so long, we felt turnabout was, well, was fair play. <laughs> so we want to use you as an illustration. I just held my breath, and every time I'm with them, and by the way, you can pray for us, because a whole state convention, those of you who are Southern Baptists, uh, from Kansas, Nebraska, the whole state convention has an annual state evangelism conference. They've asked my wife and I and my four sons to be the keynote speakers. Amen. That's going to be an awesome moment. And you need to pray for me because I just know they're going to use me as an illustration. <laughs> but my oldest son did, and this is what he said. And I just bowed my head and wept. He said, you know, when he was in college, he got up one day about, oh, about 6.30. He said, I went out uh, quietly out into the kitchen, and there's my dad. He was at the kitchen table with his head bowed in an open Bible and notes he had been taking from his time with the Lord. I tiptoed out and said, I'm going to get up before my dad tomorrow. He said, I went out at 5.30. And there was my dad with his head in the Bible and pages of notes. I know he must have gotten up a long while before I did. And then he said, I never forgot it. And my son gets up early every day to meet the Lord. I didn't know that he was even, I didn't know until he shared that that's what he had done. But now how I live my life can be one of the greatest deterrents to the pitfalls of family disaster. You can live in such a way that you are creating great prevention uh, in your children going away from the Lord. Now, there's another whole side to that, and that is if they have parted, departed from the Lord, how in the world do you get them back? And I had one of my sons who flunked the 10th grade, got in with the wrong crowd, said, Dad, I'm not going to go to college. Don't talk to me about it. I didn't know, but the Bible didn't say, parents obey your children. So I kept on telling him about going to college. <laughs> but I can remember falling on my face in the middle of the night in the living room and crying out, Oh, God, would you do something to bring my son back? And God said, I'm not here to change your son. I'm here to change his father. Amen. And God did a number on this dad. He worked me over. And I can still remember the time when that son, who wasn't going to college, by the way, he's now finishing his Ph.D. from Southwestern Seminary, has been called a pastor and loves the Lord with all of his heart. But I can remember the day he met me, if you've ever been in Fort Worth area, I-35 West and Seminary Drive, Denny's Restaurant. I sat there in a crowded restaurant, and he looked across and said, Dad, I'm so sorry for all the pain I caused you and Mom. And I want you to know I feel called into the ministry. And uh, then he added, I don't think I will be like my brothers and without thinking. You know, sometimes you wish you could bring words back. Without thinking, I said, son, nothing you've ever done has been like your brothers. Uh, <laughs> but I'm walking with him. But I want you to know one thing. The Lord brought me back to say, how you receive your wayward son, you receive me. Treat him like you would treat me and treat him like you would treat my father who sent me. Isn't that a wonderful scripture? But we need to put some very specifics on that. 
He said, why don't you love me with all of your heart and mind and soul and strength? And we want to somehow love our Lord without loving people. You can't. You can't. And I would say one of the great deterrents in God's effectiveness through pastors today is that too many pastors have lost the shepherd's heart. You don't treat the members as you were treating our Lord. If somehow, which is an impossibility, our Lord should strategically not be present, what would you do to try and find out where he was? Would you not pen up the 90 and 9 and go out at the risk of your own life to find the one that was missing? put them on your shoulders, bring them back, and the only time or one of the few times in all of the Bible that it says that all heaven breaks out into singing and praise and thanksgiving over one sinner that has repented. I found that every time I rescued one of God's children who had begun to wander and was out there at the disposal of all the elements, when I found one of his own and put them on my spiritual shoulders and brought them back, all heaven broke out into singing, and all the people of God did as well. But if you lose the shepherd's heart, you've lost your ministry. And you're listening to the reasoning of some who say, well, it's good for the church to lose some of them. And I'd say, tell me where you found that in the Scripture and say that in terms of a shepherd's heart. If you can let anybody in your church leave your church and you not pursue them, you have lost the love relationship to the shepherd himself. That's a symptom. And I would say in this generation, one of the great pitfalls to the ministry is to lose the love relationship and lose the shepherd's heart. You're not there as an administrator of a religious organization. You're a shepherd over tender-hearted sheep for whom Christ died and he entrusted them to you and he expects you to present every one of them to him. Someone asked me while I was here, he said, I, I heard you say that in your church in Saskatoon you never lost members. And I said, that's true. In the three churches I pastored, two in California and one there, I've gone back to say apart from those who moved out of the community, and changed their address to another community. We never lost any members in those three churches. I went back and tried to think through, did we lose anybody? And we didn't. And they said, well, that's astounding. And I said, no, that's Christ-like. Is Christ willing that one of his own should perish? He is not. And if he dwells within you, will he not pursue every solitary one of those for whom he died? And can I not let him shape and reshape my life until I look like him? Someone years ago made this statement to me. Henry, if you can see one of, the, one of God's sheep going astray and you do not pursue them, it's going to make all the rest of the sheep, sheep <coughs> nervous because they'll say it'll only be a matter of time before he doesn't pursue me either. But if you can pursue to the last ounce of your energy one that is astray, it'll make all the rest feel very secure to know they have a shepherd that if under any condition I should wander from the Lord, my dear shepherd is going to work for me and he's going to find me. He's going to be patient with me. He's going to love me. He's going to care for me. He's going to bring me back. What about the people in your ministry? Do your sheep know that you will pursue them because they watch you pursuing some of the worst? Well, those scriptures were sort of introduction. Let me just say, I passed, I've been in ministry 42 years. And uh, it's been an incredible incredible time with the Lord. And uh, so I come to share with you some pitfalls that God has let me avoid. And uh, I want to share some of this with you. 
uh, certainly um, the, root, the root system to your entire ministry is a love relationship to God. Everything else comes out of it. I could, I could list for you uh, all of those uh, uh, dangers in uh, the pitfalls for the pastor. And uh, we've listed them in the book. But every, let me just go to the book and I'll just, just to the list that I have. And uh, I want you to see how it relates to your love relationship to the Lord. The ones we've listed, there are 10 of them in the book. But I'm going to list some others for you as well. Pride. Pride is a disastrous pitfall for a pastor. Because pride basically says self is more important than God. And you exalt yourself and you make people obey your leadership and you insist that they follow your authority and you have all the proof text that you feel you need to make sure they all follow your leadership. That's pride. There to follow only one. And who is that? Jesus. There to follow Jesus. And when you have a building program and half the congregation doesn't feel like following you, don't quit the ministry because they're not following you. They're not supposed to follow you. They're supposed to follow Christ. And if they're following Christ and you've taught them how to do that, they just may be following Christ. And they may be trying to say to you, Pastor, don't tell me to pray about it if when I give you what I sense God has said, you're not going to listen. Many a pastor will say, Now, folks, I want you to pray about this, but you've already made up your mind and what you're thinking is that when you come back together, they're all going to have the same opinion as you. But there are a bunch there that don't have the same opinion as you. And you start to say, why they're just uh, against me. And, and you put all of those phrases together and some even go to the place where they say, well, if you're not going to follow my leadership, I just need to find another church. Well, they're not supposed to follow your leadership. They're supposed to follow his leadership. And when you ask them to pray, they will. And when they come back, they're going to express what they believe God said to them and don't ever ask the people of God to pray unless you're willing to accept what God says to your people when they tell you. Or you're just playing games with them. And you know the congregation's a lot smarter than you think they are? And there are some who say, you know, our pastor tells us to pray about it. We don't need to pray about it because he's going to tell us what God told him and then he's going to ask us all to agree with him. So we don't need to pray about it. Well, I'll tell you one thing. My congregation has saved me from a lot of sin in my own life where I was seeking the face of God and pride was there. And there are many, you know, I would say eight out of ten, I don't know how you find it, but about eight out of ten pastors that I say, how are things going? Eight out of ten pastors tell me a building program they're in. And I say, that's not what I asked you. I'm asking a different question. What's happening between you and the Lord? Well, we're building a building. What's that got to do with the kingdom? Could there be a difference? There sure could. And our pride wants to, wants to be able to say, now I've been there, folks. Our pride wants to be able to say, now when I got here, and since I've come, as if to say, my presence, when I came, God came. Pride. Folks, it'll cancel your ministry. It's one of the great pitfalls. And if you read the book, you'll see how pride affects your leadership and will ruin your leadership because of what you're doing in that regard. Sexual sin. I don't need to say much except to say what I've already said. That whole devastating area 
can be prevented from an intimate, personal love relationship with the Lord. Now, I approach things a little different than some, and I remember counseling a pastor. And uh, the pastor went ahead, had an affair with a lady in his church, divorced his wife, left the ministry. And I think the insurance industry has an awful lot of pastors who have sinned against God. And about three or four years later, I was speaking on, you might have been there. I was speaking on deny self, pick up your cross and follow me. And this pastor came up weeping and sobbing his heart out and said, when I heard you speak, I, God convicted me, it was me. I was the sinner. I sinned against God. I sinned against my wife and my children. I sinned against this other lady's husband and her family. I sinned against God and his people. Will you pray for me? Now, don't ask me to pray for you unless you're willing to let me pray for you. I said, I will indeed. But I said, let me tell you how I'm going to pray for you. And I had just read. Isn't that amazing? Before you ever have to face this, God's preparing you. I just read from Ezekiel 36, where God says, you have profaned my name among the nations. And I'm going to sanctify my name in you before those same nations. And he took him into 70 years of bondage to restore his name. I said, let me tell you how I'm going to pray for you. First of all, I'm going to pray that God will grant you genuine repentance. And second, that he will indeed forgive you and cleanse you. But I'm going to pray that God will deal with you in such a way that anybody who sees how God deals with a pastor who profanes the name of God as bad as you have, that it will be a great deterrent for anyone else even thinking about doing it. <laughs> I waited. Now is that, I said to him carefully, I said, my dear brother, I am far more concerned about God's name than I am your name. I'm far more concerned about the name of our Lord be restored than your name be restored. And you have grievously offended the name of the Lord. And I'm asking God to deal with you in His forgiving in such a way that His name can be restored but to do it in such a way that if anyone ever saw what God does with someone who does that, they would be forever deterred in even thinking about doing it. Well, he sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I just waited. You know, he had the problem, not me. And then he said, I want you to pray for me that way. And I did. And I prayed with a broken heart. Not for him, but a broken heart for what he had done to my Lord and what he had done. And how many young people were lost to the Lord because of what he had done. And the Lord just sort of poured over my soul what this man had done to my Lord. And in some way, I came to understand just a little of what Paul meant when he said, I have been crucified with Christ. I felt as though I went through that process. You don't just casually pray for someone like that. You pray out of the love relationship to your Lord. But if you lose the love relationship, it'll show in your praying. You know, when we move away from God and the heart moves from God, it shows in every solitary area of our life. Your wife sees it, your children see it, the members see it, everybody sees that you're not what you used to be and you're not the Christ that they want to know. And you'll start to realize you have shifted not because conviction had come to you, but conviction came to others. 
before it came to you. And when I hear some things from others around me, I immediately go alone with God to ask him to help me. Now, I said that we were going to take a bit of a break. Should we take a bit of a break? Cynicism. A great pitfall to a pastor. I've asked the Lord over and over and over again. Lord, don't let me be cynical in what I see happening around me. Deliver me from that. Cynicism is basically saying I know better than those around me. I have a closer walk with God than those around me do. And you can start to be cynical about the people of God. About, Pastor, I've heard too many pastors talk with great cynicism about their deacons. Don't you ever do that. Amen. My dad was a deacon. And he forever set in my heart what a deacon ought to be. The most godly, godly man and uh, whenever I hear a pastor using deacons as the object of his humor, I want to stand up and say, don't do that. A deacon is a servant of God. Yes, don't ever speak about a servant of God in a cynical way. Now, some of you may be saying, well, you don't know the deacons in my church. <laughs> and I'd say, no, I don't, but I know the God in your church. And who he has selected, you ought to treat very carefully. Don't let cynicism, don't let cynicism about the, the women's ministry or missions. And could I say to the in-house crowd, all across America, the number one deterrent to a significant ministry of prayer in the churches is the pastor's. They're the ones who are stopping prayer. And they're very cynical about it. Well, you just get a bunch of folk and they'll pray and get together and, and then they just get together to criticize the pastor. You need to understand that reveals more about your heart than it does about your church. Ask God to deliver you from any ounce of cynicism in any direction toward another man's ministry toward a pastor of a mega church and you have a smaller church and you know that you could pastor their church a lot better than they could. They just haven't asked you. <laughs> and I'd say, I can tell you why they haven't. <laughs> the Lord wouldn't let them because he knows your heart. And your heart couldn't stand it. So don't let cynicism ever be a part. It's a pitfall to ministry and cynicism uh, can eliminate you from any further use to God. I've often said that God never gives a large assignment to a small character. Your character determines where God places you. And where you are reveals how God thinks about you. Now, there is no small church, you know that. If God can put his son to be the head over 15 people, you're, you're ministering in a world mission strategy center. You're right in the middle of where the God of the universe is about to strategize to touch the rest of the world. You said, but I only have 15 people. And I said, no, you have 15 people plus God. And you just need to know if you have 15 people, you have three more than God gave his son. And he turned the world upside down. Could you not just absolutely get over any cynicism about where God has placed you? That little church that I went to, as you know, had 10 people and they had voted to disband the church. They were so discouraged. 
I've had many a person say to me, Henry, with all that God did from that little church in the 12 years God left you there, you must have had some of the most dedicated people in all the world. I said, no, I had the distilled essence of why the church had died. <laughs> the only ones left were the ones who had driven everybody else off. And then the follow-up question. Can you build a church with that kind of material? And I said, not at all. But I can tell you someone who can. My Lord can take 10 discouraged people and make a living body for His Son and fill them with His Spirit. And there's no limit to what God can do through that group. And I watched it. We didn't have a solitary college student. They had never had one. But during those years, we baptized about 180 college students. God did that. I didn't do it. I'd never been in a college ministry before until I went to that church. And they had never started a mission, and we started about 38 churches. And I'd never started a mission before. And there were so many entering the ministry, we started a whole theological training school to train them, and over 400 came through that school. But I'd never done that before. You know, if I had taken an inventory of my gifts, <laughs> I'd have never done any of that. Don't. One of the great pitfalls for the ministry is to take an inventory of your gifts and then base your ministry on your gifts. Don't do that. Let God decide what He wants to do and He'll equip you to do whatever He assigns. But you need to release your life as thoroughly to God as you know God. And then He more than likely will lead you to do things you have never done and never would choose to do so both you, your family, and everyone around you knows you didn't do it. But our pride often won't let us do that. But one of the great pitfalls is uh, taking an inventory of our gifts and what we have been successful at. And when you come to the church and they say, well, Pastor, what's your ministry? I'd say, whatever God assigns when He puts me here. Tell me, what has He been guiding you to do? I've simply come to help Him and you together to do what He's already said to you. I don't bring my ministry to the church. I simply obey Him and let Him put me wherever He wants. And then let Him unfold what He intended to do and what He'd already been doing before I got here. Would I have ever imagined what God was going to do? I couldn't have. And it was out of that, did I, could I have ever imagined that I would write Experiencing God out of that uh, experience? I'd never written before. I didn't know what to do. But one of the great deterrents would be to say, I... I don't have any gift at writing. I've never written. And God says, you know why you don't have a gift of writing? You've never written. <laughs> why don't you just do what I tell you to do? And did I, you know that that book is now in its 12th year and it's still on the bestseller list? 12 years later. Only God could have done that. And so would you release your life and avoid the pitfall of shaping your ministry according to self. Now there's, that statement I think is so powerful. The two great deterrents to being of use to God, well three, is that the average person will not deny self. We ask God to affirm self and we're always looking for the affirmation of self and God says you've got to deny self. You've literally got to die to self. So that's why God says, don't ever have a vision for what you want to do for God. God's people are never told to have vision. We're not a people of vision. We're a people of revelation. That passage which says where there's no vision the people perish is a bad translation. It basically says where there is no revelation the people throw off restraint. Or, in the common language, 
When you don't have a word from God, everyone does what is right in his own eyes and you have spiritual anarchy. And right now across the Christian community, we have spiritual anarchy. Everyone doing what is right in his own eyes. When God gives revelation, he gives it to the corporate people of God. He has always done that from the time that he entered into a covenant with his people corporately. Now, the second great deterrent and great pitfall is the unwillingness to pay the price. If you're not willing to deny self and take up a cross, and I bear witness to you, the cross is not something to suffer on, it's something to die on. And many of us will not die because human reasoning says, how could I die and live? And Jesus would say, ask me. You can't live unless you've died. A kernel of wheat has got to die or it cannot come up and produce 50-fold or 100-fold. And many, many, many a pastor never passes the test when God puts you in a difficult place and the years begin to come and go and you listen to the reports of your brethren and you have a very modest ministry and report and people keep throwing proof texts at you. You know, while, while you were there in Saskatoon, people came and said, one thing about Henry, he doesn't know how to grow a church. We had 30 then. And I said, God didn't tell me to grow a church. Jesus said he would. And I better not confuse the two. Don't listen to the world. Well, Henry, what's your vision for your church? I said, I don't have one. The Lord who's going to build a church, he has the vision. The servant does not have the vision. The master has the vision. Let the master tell you what's on his heart, and it may take a while for him to do it. But when I left 12 years later, in all of those missions, there were over 5,000 people every week in Bible study. And they said, well, you only got a 230 in your church. I said, it isn't my church. <laughs> and they, so I said to them, you know, when I came, I didn't have the faintest idea what God had in mind. But I determined I would deny self and pick up a cross and follow after him. And I can say literally, I can say with the Apostle Paul, and I don't say that, I rarely ever have said this. I want you to know that I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You can go onto the internet and find one million references to Blackaby and most of them are criticisms. And if you do the will of God, you'll be wounded Brother Roberts, I have prayed so much for you. You've been wounded over the years. You never say anything about it except you let it slip every once in a while. And I remember. But there's a man who bears in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He's not known by everybody, but I'll tell you one thing. He's known in the heavens. And you may not be known or asked to serve on a convention speaker's platform. But if heaven knows where you are, he can cause anybody in the world to know where you are. And he can put in your hand anything he wants to do. But he's got to have someone who has denied self so that whatever God does next, self will never raise its ugly head. And he's got to have you understand that the cross is very, very real. So that when the cross begins to reveal itself in your life. You will not resist it and say, I don't think I deserve this. By the way, in our ministry, in those small churches with no funding, nobody supporting us whatsoever, and those of you who know that I served with Southern Baptist and the whole convention had voted for years not to be involved in Canada by choice. And so there was no support except heaven and I bear witness, God's budget never runs short. Amen. And he's always on time. 
and always what he intended. And my children watched when we went through some tough times. And my wife, for the first time, had to go to work. And I cried all day long when Marilyn said, Henry, we, I just need to work because we can't make ends meet. And I cried all day long and said, Lord, I'm the breadwinner. I can't let her go to work. I've got five children to raise. The Lord said, but I have some people she's going to lead to me in the nursing home. When she goes as a college graduate and cleans toilets and changes beds in the nursing home to make ends meet, she's going to lead someone to the Lord that never would have heard about me had I not put her there. Are you going to deny them? Boy, talk about a cross. And I had to help my children understand the greatness of our God during those tough times. God hadn't changed, but he was testing me to see what I would do. He just wanted to know, Henry, would you forsake me when nothing went well? When, when, you, when you don't have enough milk for your little child, would you serve me with joy? And when an old Indian pastor had to come and bring you a hundred pound sack of potatoes, just to keep bread on the table. And you women, let me tell you, if you want 100 ways to cook potatoes, my wife has the recipes. <laughs> During that year, that 100-pound sack of potatoes took us through that month. And a lot of that was happening when you guys were there. And I uh, carried a load. And um, great pitfall for a pastor is threefold. Number one, you will not deny self. And number two, you will not pick up a cross. And number three, you won't follow him. <coughs> because where he wants you to go with him is not where you had the ideal ministry. And I remember when God laid on my heart, we were to start a mission church, and it was 510 miles away. And I drove it the whole way and started a mission church. And that church then started about 12 others later. And that church that I could have said, I don't, I don't think I deserve this. I have three degrees and I shouldn't have to drive 510 miles. The Lord says, you go with me where I sign you. Are you willing to follow me? Do you know, little did I know that down the road, the very first church that my oldest son would pastor <coughs> was going to be that mission church. Yeah. I didn't know it at the time. But you know why many of us never get to the destination God has for us? We're not willing to follow him because it's not where we thought we deserved to serve. He said, you don't deserve to serve anywhere. <laughs> Anything I assign as the God of the universe is more than you deserve and more than you're capable of handling. So why don't you just follow me? Lord, it'll take me on to an Indian reservation. I never thought to go there. He said, I know. And you wouldn't have gone unless you're willing to follow me. But I want you to follow me onto that Indian reservation. And I want you to take the gospel there. I could tell you some places where God took... I remember the first church I pastored in Maryland. I came from a gang warfare, growing up in gang warfare. I was not a part of a gang, but I was the recipient of gang warfare. And my life was threatened for 11 years. So I knew that side. I saw many a person killed and some of my friends killed in the process. But Marilyn came from a wonderful big church in, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I knew she was not oriented to that first community where God called us, San Pablo on the East Bay Area of San Francisco. Every major crime in that San Francisco Bay Area I knew someone involved before or immediately afterwards. I was involved totally, but I, that was my life. I knew that. But I remember deciding I'd take Marilyn with me. And I said, Marilyn, we're going to go to a very, very difficult lady. She doesn't know the Lord, but I, I want to go talk to her about the Lord, and I want you to go with me. Now I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold my little New Testament very still. 
And I want you to count the number of flies that land on my New Testament. There were 12. Her house was full of dogs and cats. And I went there and she said, Henry, I don't know that I could have ever gone had you not gone with me. I said, I know. But I wanted to see if you would follow where the Lord knew one person needed him. Amen. Even if it meant your whole New Testament was covered with flies and you couldn't even read. I said, I shook it then and read. <laughs> but are you willing to follow him wherever he takes you? To the prison? To the military? Overseas? Would you follow him overseas? Would you be the one for whom others have been praying for so long? Well, the other deterrents or pitfalls, I'll just go quickly. I got, oh, I need to give you time to ask questions. Let me read them. Greed. Pastors, we are known at times. You know what many do nowadays? When they come out of seminary, they're told, make sure you secure your retirement packet. And they're flat out full of greed. I never once in all my ministry ever asked for a raise. I never once ever brought it up. I believe God knew what our needs were. And he knew what he was doing to shape me to be like his son. And I said, oh Lord, would you protect my mind and my heart from any semblance of greed? If my car falls apart, that's fine. I'll, what I did, I didn't ask for a good car, but I asked that God would always place in the membership someone who knew how to fix cars. <laughs> Do you know that every church I pastored, there was a mechanic. And he said, you preach the gospel and I'll fix your car. And I said, it's a deal. But I never, I said, Lord, one of the great pitfalls for the ministry is a form of greed. You need to be completely and totally satisfied with whatever God gives you. He can cause your people who loves you to take care of you. And I found that has always been true. Mental laziness. I need to just say a word. One of the great pitfalls to the ministry is a mental laziness. And I'm going to pick out one area. Uh, nobody else can do the study of the scriptures for you. Do not turn to the books of men to do the mental straining that's required to get a word from God. I had a man come to me and say, Henry, do you know a good book on resolving conflict in a church? I said, yes, First and Second Corinthians. And this dear brother put his head down and said, that's not what I meant. And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, my dear brother, that's what grieves me most. I knew that's what you meant. You have mental laziness. You will not go to the scripture for yourself and let the spirit of God be your teacher. Now, pastor, let me tell you, the people know whether you brought a sermon or whether you brought a word from God. Yes. They know it every time. And your shelves ought to be completely empty. I hope nobody, I, I can ask forgive. You ought to be empty of all sermon outline books. You ought to get your message from God. And there's, I don't know of any greater, apart from the love relationship to the Lord, any greater sin in the life of pastor and pitfall is mental laziness. That we will not experience the discipline of meeting the Lord, hearing from the Lord, and letting God deal with us from His Word. Well, I just read the others. Oversensitivity, spiritual lethargy, domestic neglect, administrative carelessness. And the last one is prolonged position holding. <laughs> that means you need to know when you need to go. You're proud of the fact that you've been in the pastorate for 37 years. But part of the problem is you don't know when to let go. One of the great pitfalls in ministry is what could have been 
when you ended your ministry, you ruined because you stayed too long. <coughs> you need to ask God when to release it. Now, I've, re I've been retired two years. Retirement's not what it's cracked up to be. I've never been so busy in my life. But I just said I, I need to know when to let go because that can be a great pitfall to the ministry. Well, let me stop. I had s a, a, about five other pages of notes. But let me have you ask some questions. I want to quit on time. Would you repeat those last three or four questions? Yes. <laughs> Oversensitivity. Spiritual lethargy. You ought to be up before the earliest layman. You ought to be known as a person who is strong in your ministry. Uh, domestic neglect, that is the neglect of your wife and your children. Administrative carelessness. Do not excuse yourself by saying, I, I just never have been administratively strong. Well, you can resolve that one by some choices you make. God may have put some people around you, release the administration to them, but learn how not to be careless. And the area where you can lose it all is not knowing how to administrate or at least oversee the finances in the church. That can ruin you. And you need to know how. You know that too many pastors right now are disoriented to people. They don't know what to do with people. And I've had pastors literally tell me, you know, if I, I'd love to, the ministry if I didn't have to deal with people. I mean, literally, I've heard them say that. And I said, I'll, I'll search and find a desert island where you can go and be all by yourself. But don't occupy the role of a shepherd if you don't want the sheep. And you need to learn how. I was talking with the pastors and their staff. Of, they run 2,400 in Sunday school every Sunday. And I said, you need to know every solitary person in this church sees you as their pastor. No substitute for you. I talked to the pastor. I said, you are the pastor to all 2,400 who attend and 6,000 who are members. He said, well, I can't do it. And I said, then you better get to pastor a church where you can. Or ask God, how in the world did he do it in the early church that added 3,000 in one day and probably had 25,000 by the fourth chapter? <coughs> but you are their pastor. And they need to know that you're, the, you're their pastor. And they need to know that you have sought God to know how to be a personal pastor to everyone in your church. And a part of that is, is, is this uh, matter of administrative. But put your life in the midst of the people because they've come and they honestly believe that you're going to be their pastor. But when they get there, you're not their pastor. Uh, you need to be the pastor to every solitary person. Now, the lay people do this. I had a CEO. I work with CEOs of the Fortune 100 and 500 companies. And one of them on the call that we had said, I am responsible for 30,000 employees and their families. And I've only been a Christian three years, but God's laid a burden on my heart. How can I, how can I take care of the spiritual life of all 30,000 employees and their families? Is that possible? And I said, not to man it isn't. But to God it is. And I said, I will help you to know how to go to God so he can tell you how to be a personal involvement in every solitary employee and their families. Two years have passed, and it's astounding what God has done through that CEO of that major company. And I said, you don't know how to do it, but God does. Well, question. You have a question? I already had one. <laughs> I'm serious. I never made a request at all. And I, 
And the Lord told me how to get pastors. He said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would thrust forth laborers into his harvest. Every time we were starting a mission, I prayed that God would thrust forth a labor into his harvest who believed him and trusted him. And God was never short and never late. And my wife would say, rarely early. <laughs> but everyone, and by the way, not one of those mission pastors had to be bivocational. Because we don't believe God will provide, we tell a lot of folk, you might have to be bivocational. I never told one of our mission pastors, but I did tell them, I have no money to move you, no money to pay you. <coughs> But all who have come before you have discovered that God is perfectly capable of taking care of all of your needs. Amen. I've had some who said, I, I can't put my family through that. And when the book Experiencing God came out, they wept and said, my name could have been in that book if I'd only believed God. Amen. I said, that's true. Where there is, the, the translation that I've read, where there is no revelation, the people throw off restraint. That's what the translation says. And my, my NIV, yeah. And uh, my translation, the Henry Blackaby version, is when you don't have a word from God, everyone does what is right in his own eyes, and you have spiritual anarchy. Revelation holds the people of God together because it doesn't come from the pastor. It may come through him, but the revelation comes from God and announces what God is about to do, and that is the unifying factor. And so people don't go off on their own ministries. They follow the one that God has given to that body of believers. Okay, another question. Yeah, I can give you a hard answer. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. And as a pastor, I would have to say, oh Lord, if I don't know how to detect your voice from mine, I'm in trouble at the heart of my Christian life. Lord, don't let me just keep saying that for the next 20 years. I come to you and say, oh God, I don't know how to know your voice but you said that I could. And you talk to me about the Holy Spirit who guides me into all truth and teaches me. Help me to know when the Holy Spirit is teaching me. Help me to know whether it's me or him. And when I go to pray, you said I wouldn't know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit would teach me. And Lord, how, would you teach me how to know when the Holy Spirit is guiding me when I pray? And I had to do that. I had to ask him. There are many, many times when I come to a scripture and say, Lord, I don't have the faintest idea what you mean by this. But if you'll show me, I'll do it with all my heart and I'll receive everything you tell me. But you see, your people need to know that you know when God is speaking to you. Otherwise, they'll never know whether it's out of your head or God's heart. Now, I give you a scripture. And uh, it, it, it has worked me over. It's 1 Samuel 2, 35. God says, I'll raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do all that is in my heart and in my mind. Now, God has to do that. Did he train Samuel's ears? Yeah, that same, the next chapter it says, Samuel did not know the voice of God. And God says, well, I'll teach him. Say, oh Lord, I'm like Samuel. I don't know how to recognize your voice. But if you'll teach me, then I'll follow you every time you speak. And I'll come to know the significance of what's at stake when you speak. All of eternity hangs in the balance when you hear from God. So we can't make a mistake on that one. So just ask him. Now, I just told you not to read the books of men. Because this is a very, very, very 
sensitive issue with so many of God's people. My oldest son and I have just completed a work on hearing the voice of God. You need to know that one of the great criticisms of experiencing God is some key leaders, most of them serving in the seminaries, <laughs> they have said, Henry has the audacity to tell God's people that God speaks to them today. Amen. That is a dangerous thing to say. They don't know Hebrew and they don't know Greek. And I said, but they know the Holy Spirit who is their teacher. Yes. A farmer with a fifth grade education with an open Bible and the Holy Spirit is his teacher doesn't need to go astray. Amen. He can know as much as anybody with an education. But my mind went back to history when the Roman Catholic Church said, we better take the Bible from the people. They don't know Greek and Hebrew. And if they start to interpret the Bible, they'll get it wrong. They forgot the Holy Spirit's our teacher. Now, my brother, one of the truths that runs all the way through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is that God speaks to His people. They always know it's God. They always know what He's saying. And they always know what they're supposed to do. That was true in the Garden of Eden, and that was true in the Isle of Patmos. And almost every page in between, God speaking to His people. They know it's God. They know what He's saying. And they know what they're supposed to do. Now, they weren't always ready to do what He told them, but they knew it was God. Moses knew what God, that it was God, and he knew it was what he said, Moses just said, I don't want to do it. Find someone else. And by the way, I hope you don't ever do that and think God is appreciative of that. Do you know that it cost Moses the rest of his life? And God always matches his judgment according to your sin. And when Moses said, I can't speak, God says, fine. For the rest of your life, I'll speak to you. You speak to Aaron, and Aaron will speak to the people. You're going to have to Aaron, have Aaron with you the rest of your life. Do not believe that your sin can be overcome in its consequences. You may have to bear the consequences of your sin the rest of your life, like David did. I'm very careful about how I handle sin and how I look upon it because the Bible is so clear at that point. But just ask God to teach you. Take the scripture. Read John 14, 15, and 16. It's incredible what he says. And every time you come to something, you would have to say, here's what God says and here's what God is like, but I don't know him that way in my life. I stop right there and say, oh God, this is an invitation to know you this way. I don't know you this way. So I'm asking you to now help me to come to know you this way. And I will watch now to see how you're going to do it. And I will follow you with all of my heart. One of the great pitfalls is we try to find a book that some man has written <laughs> called Hearing the Voice of God. You know. <laughs> You've just asked an impossible task. Uh, Avery Willis and I wrote a book called On Mission with God. Living a life that glorifies God and honors Him. And uh, it's, it, if you remember the, the pattern of experiencing God, when you finally obey Him, He puts you in the arrow where God is on mission. But I didn't explain what it was like to be on mission. And so this, uh, this, this sequel is, what is it like to be on mission with God? When you've been through the process and you're now obeying Him, what's it like to be on mission with God? And what does He have to do to condition your life to be on mission with Him? And, I think, and, and the videos are very, very helpful at this point. They they're, have an unusual dimension about them. They introduce the study and they conclude it. Um, but it's just uh, helping people to know what it's like biblically from one end to the other. It takes six characters in the Bible 
to share with you the pattern of experiencing God and the next pattern, which is God calls you, God shapes you, God develops you, God conditions you, God uses you, and God sends you. And what does that look like in each of their lives? Three from the Old Testament, three from the New. So that you can recognize when God is doing that in your life. Uh, that's the purpose of that whole study. There's a workbook and there's a trade book. And I just violated what I told you not to do. But if you need some help. <laughs> I try to write in such a way that I don't do the thinking for you. But I let you walk with me as we watch God open to our hearts what's there. And then you should process it way beyond what I've done. But I've earnestly tried to help God's people to know how to walk with God. There's one other... No, I would, I would say the greatest single laziness of pastors right now is this book. And my question would be, how much time do you spend in the scriptures with a concordance and maybe a Bible dictionary asking the Spirit of God to teach you and instruct you? You can't get into one solitary truth about God that will not blow your mind. Every truth of God, you could take that one truth and study it the rest of your life and feel like you've only just begun. But we have a mental laziness that wants a quick answer. Lord, in 30 minutes, can you tell me all about the Trinity? <laughs> or if you ever start to study the cross, the greatest single thing I ever did in my life that shaped the rest of my life was a study of the atonement. The meaning of the death of Christ. I mean that absolutely turned my heart upside down. If you were to study the person of Christ, if you were to study the person of the Holy Spirit, if you were to study, our brother Roberts has just written a book on repentance. One of the best books I've ever read. Very thorough, very comprehensive. He, basically, if you take something like that, it's not a substitute for the Word. It is taking you to the Word of God and helping you to know where to look. And when you get there, you may spend a whole month just asking God to open that passage to you. But we, we want three simple steps to understanding sanctification. You can't. We're mentally lazy. We want the simplified version. There isn't any simplified version. You follow what I'm saying? Ask, honor God by giving Him your mind and believe ahead of time there's not any truth in this book that will not blow your mind. Once you start to read it and the Spirit of God starts to overwhelm you, You'll say, stop, stop, I can't take anymore. But we're mentally lazy. We just want a quick fix. Could you give me a simple three-point outline and don't forget the poem, and, and I'll be grateful. <laughs> don't do it.